Hello, and welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Chelsea White. And I'm Sam Wong. Welcome to the show. It's episode 192. We're recording this on May the 17th. Coming up this week, we have a fascinating story on extending the lifespan of mice and how that could translate to humans, as well as a mind-bending story of particles that remember the past. And we'll also be discussing the link between irregular sleeping patterns and early death, and the surprising role the Pacific Ocean plays in the life of desert grasslands in North America. Plus, we'll be talking about how kangaroo feces could make the world a better place. Joining us to talk through all this are New Scientist journalists Michael LePage, James Deneen, Alexandra Thompson, and Alex Wilkins. Let's jump in with an extraordinary story about life extension. Michael, you've reported this week on a mutation found in mice that makes them live 20% longer. And to me, that sounds like kind of a lot. But haven't we found mutations before that make mice live longer? Is there something special about this one? Yeah, so we have found lots of other mutations that make mice live longer. But the thing is that with most of them, there's no obvious way to use the findings to extend human lifespan. Hmm. Basically, you'd need to be born with that mutation to live longer. And of course, we don't have it. So what's exciting about this particular discovery is that the team has shown that by transplanting blood cells with this mutation from one mice to another, they can transfer those life-extending benefits. So this is, it's potentially something that could be done in people. Okay, that's, that's fascinating. But aren't they risky blood stem cell transplants? It seems like there's that catch-22 of it's too risky to try it in people until we know that it works, but we can't know unless we try it in people. That's definitely an issue with many potential anti-aging treatments. But in this case, a team in Taiwan that discovered this mutation, they've shown that one of the ways it extends life is by making these immune cells better at fighting cancer. And so we've already got people with cancers such as leukemia who are getting blood stem cell transplants as part of their treatment. And there is this problem that these cancers do sometimes come back after they get these treatments. So the idea is that if you added this mutation to those blood stem cells that were given to people with leukemia, it could help reduce the chances of cancer recurring. So if that procedure went ahead and lots of people got these transplants, we could then would have a chance to find out if this really does extend human lifespan or not. And is that going to happen anytime soon? Well, the researcher who's discovered this mutation and who's studying it, James Shen at Taipei Medical University, he's currently collaborating with biotech companies interested in trying this. So we don't have any timeline as such yet, but they are definitely pursuing it. And if they do try this in people who are having a cancer treatment and they end up living longer, is it something that we could use to extend the lives of healthy people? Yeah, I I think it's very likely to become feasible. So right at this moment, the reason why a blood stem cell transplant is risky is because you have to kill off the existing blood stem cells first. And that's done with chemicals and radiation that can have lots of nasty side effects, even including infertility. But people are already working on sort of more targeted, safer ways of, of killing off those cells. And I think by the time we get to the point where we find out whether this mutation really does extend human life or not, there'll be many safer ways of, of doing blood stem cell transplants. Can you tell us what is this mutation anyway? Yeah, this is a mutation in a gene for a protein that's called KLF1. Is that anything to do with the band? Uh, it, it's, it's like Wait, what's the band? this band? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know uh, this band. <laughs> this is a, a pair of techno people who did some really interesting stuff way back did, in the 80s and 90s. I anyway, they burned a big back. pile of money, didn't they? <laughs> yes, that's right. It burnt a million pounds. Wow. Anyway, so the this KLF1 protein is a kind of master switch that's produced in blood cells, and it controls the activity of a whole host of other genes. And so Shen was simply trying to find out what this protein does and how it works. And as part of that, his team created these mice with a mutation in part of this gene. And then they just happened to notice that these mice were sort of staying more active than other mice as they got older and their hair stayed shinier and and so on. And that's what led to this discovery. So this was just an accidental discovery. They didn't set out to create these, you know, very long lived mice. No, it was entirely fortuitous, this discovery. And so because KLF1 is this kind of master switch that controls lots of other genes, this mutation has a whole host of different effects. But the team has found that one of them is to lower the levels of a protein called PD-1. And that's really interesting because that's how a lot of really effective new anti-cancer drug works by targeting PD-1. So I think even if this discovery doesn't lead to anti-aging treatments, it could well help improve treatments for cancer. 
Next up, Sam's got news of a surprising solution to the problem of cow gas. <laughs> Tell us more, Sam. Yeah, so as we probably all know by now, cows are a major contributor to global warming. They've got these bacteria in their stomachs that produce methane, which is a really potent greenhouse gas, 30 times more potent than CO2. So cows and and other farm animals account for about half the world's methane emissions. So there's been lots of research into looking at how to reduce methanogens, which are the methane producing bacteria in their stomachs with different food or drugs or vaccines. But the latest study suggests replacing them with different kinds of bacteria that are found in kangaroos. Kangaroos? Uh, Do they have a similar kind of digestive system to cows? Uh, Their system is a bit different. So instead of the four compartments that cows have, kangaroos have a more tube-like stomach and the food passes through more quickly. They don't sort of chew the cud like cows do. But crucially, they have different kinds of bacteria that produce much less methane and they produce acetic acid instead, which is the acid you get in vinegar. Vinegar. So would that, (laughs) forgive me, would that change the smell of a cow fart? (laughs) Like, would it be more vinegary? Uh, I hope that it wouldn't affect the farts too much uh, because, (laughs) you know, we have acid in our stomach and, you know, it doesn't come out the end, thankfully. Fair enough. (laughs) But but yeah, the front end of the digestive system, they would have different emissions. So this does sound like an improvement, but how easy is it to replace the bacteria in cow's stomachs? Good question. Uh, So they haven't got that far yet, but a team at Washington State University have done an experiment with a bioreactor that's designed to mimic the stomach of a cow. So they filled it with some cow stomach fluid to provide the microbiome, and they put in the same nutrients that you'd find in cow stomachs. And then they collected some fresh kangaroo dung from petting zoos, and they grew the bacteria from that in the lab. And then they put these bacteria into the artificial cow stomach. And when they did that at first, it didn't have much effect on the methanogens. But then when they tried adding a chemical that inhibits the methanogens and then putting in the uh, the other bacteria so that they could outcompete them, then that did work. And it meant that the artificial cow stomach didn't produce any methane. Uh, okay, so we haven't fully solved the cow gas problem yet. No, uh, unfortunately, the team, uh, they're looking at doing fecal transplant experiments in real cows, but they haven't done that yet. So for now, the best solution to the cow gas problem is not to eat cows or dairy products. Now time for a quick break. In June, New Scientist has an exciting masterclass in London. It's our instant expert event on the wonders of space. Join us for a day of exploring the mysteries and marvels of the universe with six leading scientists. You will start where everything began at the Big Bang, and then throughout the day, you'll hear about the formation of galaxies, the latest research into the sun, the mysterious physics of black holes, the quest to find life on Mars, and the discovery of habitable planets outside our solar system. The day-long event will be hosted by a new scientist journalist, and there will be plenty of time to ask your questions to our experts. We have a special early booking offer on now, so book before Sunday, May 21st to get the discount. For more information and to register, visit newscientist.com slash wonders of space. We're back with a story about a long sought after particle that can remember its past. It has finally been discovered on a quantum computer of all places. So Alex, what's the story? Yeah, so for a really long time, researchers have been hunting for evidence of this special particle called an anion. There's something really unique about these particles, which is when you swap them in for one another, they retain a memory of the other particle that they've been swapped with. Now, all other particles in the universe, like photons, electrons, any particle you can think of or you learn at school, these are all unrecognizable after you've swapped them in and out. Whereas these anions, you can actually tell them apart. And anions, these aren't true particles like photons or electrons, are they? No, they're what's called quasi-particles. These are sort of collective vibrations that behave as if they're a particle but they're not true particles in the sense that you might have learned about them. But it does mean that theoretically you can find them in all sorts of different physical systems. So anywhere where their sort of fingerprint is left, that that counts as an anion. And that's what researchers did here. They created the sort of trademark vibrations that defines uh, these quasiparticles using a quantum computer. That all sounds really cool, but is there any uh, anything useful we can do with that? Yeah, so as I'm sure you can tell, I've left a lot of detail out. Um, <laughs> this wasn't just any anion that researchers are looking for. Researchers have found your bog standard anion in, in other systems, but this was a special kind called a non abelian anion. It's a bit of a mouthful, but what that means is that they bear a memory of the order in which they've been swapped. 
a bit like when you're sort of um, braiding a piece of rope and folding the strands over each other, you can tell the order in which the strands have been crossed over when you're examining it at the end. But instead of physically crossing over strands of rope, uh, the anions here are interacting through the quantum phenomena of entanglement. So when you can braid anions together in this way, sort of weaving them through space and changing the way they're entangled, you can begin to do computations with them. And best of all, they're really error resistant because of the way in which they're braided. Wow, that's some mind-bending stuff. And how did they create these non-abelian anions? Yeah, so the company that created the quantum processor called Continuum, they have just released their latest quantum processor, which they call H2. The researchers entangled the computer's qubits or quantum bits in a formation called a Kagome lattice, which is this pattern of interlocking stars, which is traditionally seen in woven Japanese baskets. This gave the qubits an identical quantum mechanical wave function to those that are predicted for anions. Sounds simple. <laughs> Very simple. Yeah, um, I've simplified a lot, as, as you suggest. Um, the, the amount of sort of really complex maths and physics that's going on here is really eye-watering. For instance, one of the shapes that they braided these anions into to prove that they were anions was a pattern called the Borromean rings, which is a series of three interlocking circles, a bit like what you see on the Olympic logo. And when anions move around each other in this pattern, they come up with a really distinctive wave function, which they help to use verify that these were anions. I love that they used all these like really sort of beautiful patterns that I that surprised me. I didn't know that was yeah, part no, of quantum computing. <laughs> it's a really elegant paper. And uh, if, if you have a few spare hours, I recommend going through it. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that tonight. But I'm wondering, is has there been any criticism of this discovery? I know there was some controversy about a wormhole sort of created on a quantum computer recently. Uh, some people said it wasn't a wormhole at all, but a simulation of a wormhole. Is there any concern of that here? Yeah, so there's this long-standing debate about the nature of things created on quantum computers because what you're doing is you're simulating matter. One person I spoke to said that the anions found on Continuum's computer are a simulation and that they're one step removed from the real thing, which means you can't necessarily generalize this is what anions will look everywhere. And non-abelian anions are also predicted to exist in real physical systems. So it's unclear whether this is the, the real deal. But I did speak to the researcher and he told me that a counterintuitive property of these anions is that they're not really physical because they're quasi-particles and they don't care what they're made of. They can just be completely described by quantum information and entanglement. So there's no difference between the two, according to this researcher. Now, onto an interesting but quite alarming story that has linked irregular sleep to an increased risk of death over the next seven years. Alex? Yeah, I think it's important to stress that this research shows a correlation between irregular sleep and an increased risk of death over the study's seven-year follow-up period. It doesn't show that irregular sleep itself is the cause of these fatalities. Okay, good. <laughs> that makes me feel better. Um, but so what did this study actually find? It looked at the sleeping habits of nearly 89,000 people aged between 40 and 69 over one week. They were then given a score out of 100 that measured their sleep regularity. So scoring 100 means you go to bed and wake up at exactly the same time every day. And scoring zero means this is done at different times each day. People who scored 41 or below were more likely to die over the next seven years of any cause or cancer or heart disease specifically than those who had the average score of 61. So how could irregular sleep and an increased death risk over the short term be linked? Well, one idea is that consistently going to bed and waking up at different times affects our circadian rhythm or our body clock. And this then throws our body's various physiological processes out of sync. So, for example, this may affect cell division, leading to cancer. But another idea is that having a medical condition like cancer or heart disease, which many of the participants did, may affect sleep either by affecting those physiological processes or just the anxiety of living with such a condition. So it's correlation, not causation. Do these findings come as a big surprise? 
Well, the results describe a relative increased risk of death over the next seven years, not the absolute risk. But nevertheless, one source did say, look, no one would be surprised if a lack of oxygen or food or water affected your health. So maybe we should take sleep as seriously. Next up, we have a story about the Chihuahuan Desert in North America, where researchers have discovered that a link between desert grasslands and the Pacific Ocean may have been broken by climate change. James, tell us what's happening. Sure. So you never knew grass was this complicated. So these dry grasslands in the Chihuahuan Desert are some of the most biodiverse grasslands on the continent, and they're dynamic places regularly going through cycles of spreading and dying back. And now researchers have linked that pattern to a slow, decades-long cycle of surface temperature in the Pacific Ocean that's known as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. So the ocean is influencing desert plants. How does that work? Yes. So just like El Nino and La Nina, the ocean's changing temperature can influence the climate of distant regions via atmospheric circulation. And it seems the Pacific Decadal Oscillation influences things like precipitation, temperature, cloud cover, and so on in the Chihuahuan Desert. And that, in turn, has an effect on the plants. And for much of the historical record, it seems grasslands boomed when the oscillation was in its warm phase and collapsed during its cool phase. How did the researchers discover the link? So for such a long-term relationship, you need a long-term record. And fortunately, for more than a century, the U.S. Department of Agriculture has maintained detailed records of changes in a large grassland in New Mexico called the Hornada Experimental Range, keeping records of things like the amount of grass, what species were there, and so on. And researchers took this record and then modeled how well different climatological factors were able to explain changes in the grassland. And they found that the grassland and the Pacific changed together for much of the 20th century and probably long before that as well. But then this relationship has changed more recently. Is that right? Yes. Since the late 1970s, grassland cover has remained persistently lower than what the researchers would expect based on what was happening in the Pacific. So then, assuming their models are right, is the link broken? It could be. And the researchers aren't sure exactly why. It could be due to human-caused warming or possibly due to the success of invading shrubs, which are more resilient to drought than grasses. The grasslands have also been altered by livestock grazing, agriculture, and other human activity. But whatever the causes, the researchers say their work shows that a threshold of change has been crossed on these grasslands. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening to New Scientist Podcasts. Do subscribe to our show and check out our archive. It's all free. Thanks to our guests, Michael LePage, James Deneen, Alexandra Thompson, and Alex Wilkins. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.